to memorize certain things for a test. Everybody here memorize this verse, uh, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that tells us very plainly, very clearly, a gift. You don't do nothing to keep it, it is a gift. He don't give you something, and then if you don't, he don't like something you do, take it back away from you. He gives it, it's a gift. Now you can mess up, uh, but your salvation is a gift. You're born, of, uh, you're born again into his family. So when you get saved, you become a child of God, uh, and you're in God's family. So don't, don't forget that. Um, uh, it, it's, it's amazing, really. Uh, but look, look, look at verse 10 tonight, and uh, we'll start there this evening and try to cover some ground tonight. Look at verse number 10. Now, verse 9 said, Not of works, lest any man should boast. 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There comes your works right there, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Notice how the Lord puts that Bible together so that all these people that take advantage of the grace of God get rebuked in the very next verse. People say, oh, well, we're saved by grace, so it really don't matter. Uh Uh-uh, not so fast. You are saved by grace, and it is not of works, but he saved you unto good works. That's the very next verse. The, The Bible does that over and over and over and over. About the time you think you found you a verse that makes it all right if you do something wrong, he'll nail you in the very next verse. It happens over and over and over and over. So he goes, next, verse 8 says, uh, salvation by grace. And then the very next verse said, but just because it's by grace don't mean you're supposed to loaf around and live like a devil. He created you unto good works. So good works is a proof that you've got the gift of God, which is salvation. That's what it is. That's what good works are. My good works only mean one thing as far as the world's concerned. It has absolutely no effect on my name in the book of life. My good works is showing people, hey, he must have got saved. Look at the change in him. Unto good works. And so a Christian ought to have good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 11, wherefore remember, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, make sure you note that word in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. That would, that would be the Jew. Flesh made by hand. So right now in this verse, three different groups. There's uh, the, the circumcised, which would be the Jews. Uncircumcised, be Gentiles. And then any of them that's saved, and that would be the church. Now, that to read the Bible, honestly, you have to say it, that, that thing of circumcision is all the way through the Bible. And it was given by God back in the Old Testament as a sign between him and Israel. And it was given for cleanliness, to keep the spread of disease and uh, infection and stuff down. It is still practiced today among most doctors and people in the civilized world, uh, not for any religious purposes, but uh, for a act, uh, just a st- thing about cleanliness. So, but in the Old Testament, it meant that uh, uh, was was God's people, God's people. Uh, God commanded them to be circumcised. Now, it is a type of when you get saved, you are spiritually circumcised, cut, like with a knife. And what happens when a person gets saved, the Holy Spirit, that sharp two-edged sword, cuts your body loose, your soul loose from your body so they're not stuck together no more. You ever notice when you read the Old Testament, it talks about that soul, if your soul don't do this, it'll do this. It speaks of your soul and body almost synonymously in the Old Testament like they're one and the same. But when you get saved, they're cut loose. And that explains a lot of stuff. That explains a lot of stuff. Like, he that is born of God does not commit sin. Well, if that means your body, there ain't nobody born of God. 
because there ain't nobody that don't sin. But he that is born of God does not commit sin. Your flesh is not born again. Your spirit, and you're born again as a new man on the inside of you. I used to hear uh, Dr. Ruckman, he'd say it like this. He said, you're a good man living in a bad body. That's what you are as a Christian. You ever wonder why you struggle? You ever wonder why there's part of you who wants to do right and there's part of you who wants to live like the pure devil? And you, you want to do right over here and you think you're going to go crazy. And you will go crazy if, you'll try, if you try to do both. You, you're, you're too much in the church to enjoy sinning and you're too much in the world uh, to enjoy church. And it'll drive you crazy. You will go nuts. That's why a lot of people commit suicide and everything because they're, they're, they say, oh, I'm saved. When you're saved, you can't live wrong long. <laughs> uh, you, you, it, it'd drive you up a wall because you think, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. After the Lord's done for me, look what the Lord's done for me, and then look what I'm doing. But, God, I'm weak in my flesh, my flesh, my spirit, my flesh. That's your flesh and your spirit battling. I've been fighting that battle since I was 18. Sometimes I've let my flesh win, and I've paid a price for it every time. I paid a price for it every time. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. If you let your flesh have its way long enough, you can go to an early grave. Lord, Lord, let you die. First Corinthians chapter 5. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. So when, when the Lord cuts your soul loose from your body, that's spiritual circumcision. That's us, the church. Now, there's the real fleshly, like he said in that verse, fleshly circumcision, Jews, fleshly uncircumcision, Gentile. There's only three groups of people in the world, Jew, Gentile, church. Everybody who's a Jew is a direct descendant of the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, not Ishmael. That's where the, that's where the Muslims come from, through uh, uh, Hagar. It, the, son, the promise is through Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody who's that lineage is Jewish. Everybody else, which will be about all of us in here tonight, is Gentiles. Gentiles that were outside of God's promises. Now, when a Jew gets saved, he's part of the church. When a Gentile gets saved, he's part of the church. But everybody's in one of them three groups. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll move along here because got a lot. we got a lot to talk about for just a few minutes tonight. So make sure when you read verse 11, you understand we were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, but, look at verse 12, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth and strangers from the covenants of promise. Hold your finger right there. That commonwealth and covenant is strictly Jewish. The covenants that God made with Israel. God never made no covenant with Gentiles in the Old Testament. He made covenant with Israel, and there's a bunch of them. I've got a study at home uh, by the Ruckman on the covenants. Uh, if any of y'all had enough desire and patience to listen to them, you'd learn some, several hours of study on the covenant. God made a covenant with Adam and Eve. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant. There's about seven of them in the Old Testament. And we, we were, before we got saved, we were out there. Now, I want you to look at the middle of verse 12. This is very important. Going back to what we studied the first Wednesday night, we've done this. We are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, watch this, having no hope and without God in the world. Now look at that tonight. We were strangers. We had no hope. We had no God. We had no promise. We had no strength. We had no... We had no um, uh, no excuse. Bible said without excuse. Now, do you see what I just now read to you? Remember the first Wednesday night we studied this? We studied about that Calvinism doctrine and the doctrine of Calvinism, which says that you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And a real true blue Calvinist and a lot of our Baptist friends who are, but they won't admit it because they know everybody would take a fit if they just come around and said it. But they're very Calvinistic in their preaching and I, they, they give their self away by certain things. Um, but the biggest giveaway is they don't believe in soul winning. Or at least they don't practice it. I guess if they believed in it, they'd practice it. And they don't believe in soul winning or bus ministry. I guess if they believed in it, they'd practice it. Which means this. They mean that all the elect's going to get saved anyway. 
And there ain't nothing nobody can do about it one way or the other. Now, if you were the elect before the foundation of the world, you were not without hope and without God. Everybody understand what I just said? You were never, it said you were having no hope. So if you were, you had plenty of hope. Now they'll say this. They'll say, well, you had hope, you just didn't know it. Until you got saved, then you realized it. That ain't what the verse said. The verse said you had no hope and you had no God and no promise before you were saved. That means this, ladies and gentlemen, you were not in Christ till you got saved. And you were not predestinated until you were in Christ. He said you were predestinated in Him. You didn't get in Christ before the foundation of the world. Uh, it, it's like this. It said Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, right? Now, He, didn't ha- he wasn't slain until 2,000 years ago. But God knew it and for, ahead of time, and it was His foreknowledge. Jesus didn't die before the foundation of the world. He died only 2,000 years ago. But it said he was from the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's like it says whose names are in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Your name wasn't in the book of life at the foundation of the world. Your name has been put in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And I hope that's making sense to you, especially preachers, because you're going to be, the, the Southern Baptist right now is getting eat up with this Calvinistic belief. It makes a big swoop through about every third. 30 years, 25 years, and it's making a big one right now. Preachers are falling like crazy because they're, it's like this. The pressure's on. The pressure's on, man. We ain't getting nobody saved. Nobody's getting saved. Can't get nobody saved. I can't get nobody to get saved. And then somebody comes along and said, well, you don't have to worry about it. You just preach the gospel and feed the flock, and God will save them when he's ready. Oh, really? Hallelujah. I like that. I can take it easy and just feed my church flock and let God do the saving. And that, that's a false doctrine. That's a false doctrine. Here's the way it works. Don't ever forget me saying this. Don't ever forget me saying this. Put this in your memory of your heart. You're supposed to work like it all depends on us. And you're supposed to pray and believe like it all depends on God. Now a Calvinist says it all depends on God, so ain't nothing we can do about it. No way. Let's just enjoy being saved. And a person who don't, is a, a real true Armenian, believes that we have to work real hard to stay saved and that we have a free will to get in and we got a free will to get out. Now the truth is, you got a free will to get in and you don't have a free will to get out. You can get in, anybody can get in, but you don't, you don't get out of God's family once you're in. It's just like but my, my girls can't get out of my family. They don't have my blood in them. My blood's in them. And so... Uh, if always remember that verse right there, having no hope. I, I know preachers, I know pre- and then some good preachers. I know some good preachers, and they won't uh, they won't admit it, but they're very very Calvinistic in their belief. Now I uh, believe that John Calvin had some good thoughts. I do believe the Holy Spirit has to draw a person before they can get saved. I just believe He draws everybody. Amen. Amen. They don't. They don't. Uh, they just believe he draws certain ones and they can't refuse because it's irresistible. And that's not true. The irresistible, a, t- a tulip, that's their doctrine. That's a Presbyterian church. Uh, tulip, total depravity, which that, that don't extend to the will, so that's not, not right. You're totally depraved, but you have a will. You can, you can will to get saved. It's not like, it's not like, it's, it's not like all these little leaves here are people in the world and they're all dead. And I'm God saying, I want that one, bang. I want that one, bang. I want that one, bang. And they come alive. That's what they believe. They said, you, a dead man can't receive Christ. I've heard them say it over and over and over and over and over. So, you, so the Lord has to receive him for you. Or you receive him before you get eternal life. You, you have to quicken, you, you don't, the Lord don't quicken you before you believe. They say you can't believe until the Lord quickens you. That's not true, man. God don't make you alive and then you believe. You believe and then you're quickened and made alive. 
Now, I know that's, and most of you people couldn't care less about that because you had in the fuss this evening and didn't get your dishes washed or aggravated. I know that. I understand that. But you have to learn stuff like this. You have to learn. Uh, you listen to somebody like old John MacArthur, something like that, complete Calvinist. And he, he might have some good teaching, but that's why their church is dead as four o'clock in the morning. I'm not being that being critical, but there's no life in what they're saying. And 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 him, I believe that. If a person, if a person is constantly harping, I've heard a Baptist preacher say, "You can go out here and beat your knuckles off on these on, on these doors if you want to, but it won't do no good unless God's in it." That is that is anti scriptural. Hey, if you go out and beat your knuckles on doors to try to witness people, he's in it. He said, "You go and lo, I am with you always." He's in it, brother. You don't have to wonder if God's in it when you go out here telling somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you, your heart ought to be right, but they, there's, they think that you're supposed to sit around and one day the Lord moves on you and said, you better go over and talk to Uncle, Uncle James. He's liable to die tomorrow. And you go over and talk to Uncle James and he gets saved. Now, that has happened. As they see there, God was in it that time. 99% of this other stuff y'all do, God ain't in it. Well, just because somebody don't get saved don't mean God ain't in it. Uh, uh, most time people don't get saved. But if you... We got something? I know, I've been hearing it. Which one? This one? There are two down. One, two. I'll try another one. It takes, it takes a while to get this stuff adjusted, y'all. I'll try to stay right here. If not, I'll just put me on the orange one. Will it work? All right. Um, they've done a great job to you. They did. I'm telling you, they did. Um, and uh, if you don't believe it, try it sometime. It's it's like flying an airplane. You can't take your hands off them buttons. You can't take your eyes off what's going here. So never look at your phone back there. Ever. Ever. Unless you see me looking at mine. Don't you look at your phone. You're flying an airplane. Airplane pilot's got to keep his eyes on the skies. Ain't that right? But uh, uh, look here. Ephesians 2, where do we get to? 12, we're going to have to hurry. We're going to have to hurry. Y'all hold me up. No hope without God in the world. Down just that deal. But now, glory to God, now we can shout. We didn't have no hope. I didn't have no hope before I got saved. Hope ain't in the government. Hope ain't in your, in your doctor. We're all going to die and rot. Worms going to eat you as soon as you get in the ground. As soon as they can get through your coffin, you can buy an expensive coffin. They'll get you anyway. That thing, will, that thing, you'll, you'll, you know what? If you, if you got somebody after they've been dead hundred years, you put them right there. You just go blow them off down there like that. Suck them up, sweep them in the dustpan. That's your, that's your hope. No hope, no hope. But glory to God. Look at verse thirteen. We can shout. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off. What's far off mean? Partying. What's far off mean? Drinking. What's far off mean? Smoking pot. What's far off mean? Some fool doing some stupid stuff like drugs and, and fornication and adultery and lying and living. You who were in time far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Glory to God for the blood. Glory to God for the blood. Hallelujah. One of them uh, new versions of the Bible, I think it's good news, for, good news for modern man. One of them versions, it said we're made nigh by his death on the cross, or the death of Christ. And um, uh, Ruckman checks the Greek on that, and he said there's not one Greek manuscript that says that. They're always talking about the King James not being translated right. And the, the good news says you're made by the death of Christ or the death of Christ's cross, death on the cross, something like that. Uh, yeah, the death of Christ. You are made nigh by the death of Christ. You know what that is? That's a bunch of big shot people that shy away from talking about the blood because it's a little too nasty sounding and a little too slaughterhouse religion sounding for them. Not one Greek manuscript says death of Christ. They all say the blood of Christ. You know what, buddy? Don't ever be ashamed of saying the only thing that got me and you out of the hell hole and brought us nigh to God is the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Amen. You ain't no good person. You didn't turn good and straighten up and turn over a new leaf. God, Lord, have mercy. No, I'm telling you, we're made nigh 
by the blood of Christ. You know what? The Lord showed up over at the, at the youth rally the other night, and I, I was I was over there and I thought, my goodness. I mean, I mean, you say, well, it's because we prayed and fasted. Well, that's sort of true. The fasting definitely brought on, but all that praying and fasting did is just clear out a place where he can come down. It got us in the shape that he can round us. And uh, by the way, youth rally's over, but don't quit. Keep it up. Keep it up. I encourage everybody, fast as the Lord leads you. It's good for you. In every way, mentally, physically, spiritually, every way. You say, please don't stop, Brother Danny. No, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you learn how to discipline that flesh a little bit, and uh, and it'll help you. I'm, I'm preaching myself. I mean, you know I do fast, but I sure do like sugar. I'm telling you, I've, I've got to, I, I let myself slip every year, too. You know, I, 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 Pepsi and ice cream and stuff, and I try to do real good for a while. Back on it again. Back on that stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, we have to discipline yourself. Because if you don't, it'll your body, it'll, it'll, it's not good for you. Not good for you. You know, kind of plaque builds up in you and all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, I remember when I had, uh, I had Dr. Ruckman in the car with him one time. We was going somewhere uh, from church. And Carrie was about, I don't know, five, six years old. And she's, I don't know, you probably don't remember, drinking a drink in the back seat. She's drinking a drink in the back seat. And he turned around and said, some things will gum up your veins, man. That's all he said. I'll never forget him saying that. Them will gum up your veins. I just pictured like, like molasses in my blood veins and my blood trying to get through there. And it can't. But I think if you, if you exercise hard enough and long enough, it keeps them flushed. I'm hoping, praying that's right. <laughs> but uh, too too much of it, honest, absolutely is bad for you. But I don't know how I got off on all that. Oh yeah, about the fasting and praying. But uh, that's my that's my belief. Bless God. But um, I think I think you should have a little sugar, and I ain't talking about kissing. Uh, that's all right if you're married, and you know, I know you're getting your sugar from the one you're married to, and it's opposite sex. Lord, you have to say everything nowadays. Uh, but uh, I think it's okay. A little sugar's okay. A little salt's okay. A little salt's okay. Salt is good. That's what Jesus said. Uh, so a little, but not much. If you sweat a lot, salt okay. So where'd I get to? We're, we're, we're on 14. He's our peace. Look at verse number 14. He is our peace. You know why a lot of you ain't got peace? You ain't right with the Lord. Get right with the Lord. You'll, he'll give you peace. You say, I just ain't got no peace. He's our peace. No matter how you feel, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! We have peace tonight, y'all. We have peace through Jesus Christ. He is our peace. Who hath made both one. Somebody holler, who's the both? Who's the both? I mean, who is the both? At least they'll help me. Jew and Gentile. That's exactly right, Bob. The both is Jew and Gentile. He made both one. He's took Jew, he's took Gentile, and made them one. So if I have a, a full-blooded Jewish man right here tonight sitting right here, there's no difference in me and him, none. As far as salvation goes, or so he ain't more right with God than I am. He ain't favored by God no more than I am. The Jews are God's earthly chosen people physically. The church, uh, it, we'll talk about the household in a minute. God has a household, and it's symbolized like this. God the Father and his estranged wife, Israel, whom he had to put away for her adulteries in the Old Testament. And then there's God the Son, Jesus Christ, and his fiance bride, the church. We are not married to him right now. People say, well, we're, we're the wife. No, we are espoused. Paul said, I have espoused you to one, one, the wedding ain't took place yet. It's going to take place up yonder in the sky, and we're going to come back here for our honeymoon. So the way that thing works is, you're God the Father, Israel is God's wife, they're going to work things out. God's son is Jesus Christ, his bride is the church, we're going to marry him one day, and that's God's family, that's God's family. And you're a part of that, if you're part of it, preachers disagree with that, but they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, that, that is the truth. That's the way it's going to happen. One of these days, 
uh, God will recon reconcile with Israel. The meek shall inherit the earth. And the bride, Jesus and his bride, are going to live in that brand new mansion he's building for his uh, fiance for when they get married. We're going on a thousand year honeymoon here on this earth and enjoy the Lord. You talk about Lady Diana and Princess Charles, get out of here. What a cheap redneck wedding. Brother, when he gets married, we marry him. We're going on a thousand year honeymoon and then moving to our brand new solid gold mansion. He knows how to do a wedding now, buddy. He knows how to marry a lady and treat her right. I'm telling you, solid gold mansion. Mine's made out of pine wood <laughs> and shingles. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, the Lord's going to do that right. Now, look at here. Look here, verse 14, let's hurry. Uh, he's our peace who hath made both, Jew and Gentile, one, we're all one in Christ, and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Hold your finger there. It's like there was a wall between Jew and Gentile all the way through the Old Testament. Remember when Jesus talked to the woman at the well? She couldn't believe he spoke to her. You remember all through the Old Testament? They said, them Gentiles, they're full, they're the wicked nations, get rid of all of them. There was a wall. When he died on the cross, he tore that wall down. He tore that wall down. Let's look and see what it was. Having abolished, verse 15, in his flesh on the cross, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so make him peace. Now, put your finger right there. This is another important verse, verse 15. You need to know what verse 15 is saying because you're going to make you're going to meet people that are crazy all through your Christian life trying to witness and they're going to say Jesus done away with the law Jesus done away with the commandments we're not under the commandments no more and they think that the complete Old Testament was completely abolished you don't even worry about it no more but look what the verse says look what the verse says it said he abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Make sure you learn that. Everybody in here needs to learn that right there. The only law that Jesus abolished were commandments contained in ordinances. Touch not, taste not, dietary laws, special days, the Sabbath day. Those were ordinances. In other words, listen to me. It's very, I, I say this stuff, I just take for granted, everybody knows it, but I know a lot of you don't. It, it's like this. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't wipe out all the, he didn't wipe out the, all the commandments. Only the ones contained in ordinances. Like you couldn't eat, you couldn't eat catfish. You couldn't eat shrimp. You couldn't eat scallops. You couldn't eat pork, you couldn't eat ham. You couldn't eat pork chops. It was all wrong in the Old Testament. That's ordinances. You couldn't walk but so far. Uh, the Sabbath day, you had to keep it. Oh, you could do no work from Friday evening at 6 o'clock to Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. None. You could be killed for it. Those are the commandments contained in ordinances, and he nailed them to the cross. Now, the other commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, body, strength, uh, thou shalt not covet, all of those are still in effect for us as Christians today. Amen? You know how I know that? They're all repeated in the New Testament for Christians. Those ordinances, he took them out of the way, nailing them to the cross. So there's no longer any reason for us to bring sacrifices and offer blood of bulls and goats on altars. That was done on the cross. We don't keep one day above another. Now, we keep Sunday because it's the first day of the week but we go to church on the Lord's day, there's actually no commandment in the New Testament that one day is any different than any other day. Not really, not a commandment. Now, we do, we do believe the Lord's day should be used to honor Him and respect Him. We set aside the Lord's day. That's when the disciples met. That's when they had church. They didn't go vacationing and, and, and loafing and stuff on the Lord's day. They, they met, they prayed, they took up the offering, they preached, and all that on the Lord's day. But they had no, you can't make a commandment out of that. I've heard preachers try to do it. Bless God, if you have to work on Sunday, you ought to, you're, you're wicked as the devil. Now hold on a second, hold on a second. I don't want a job working on Sunday, 
And I ain't going to have a job working on Sunday unless I absolutely had to feed my family. I ain't going to take one just because it makes pays more money. But ain't you glad all the cops don't take off on Sunday? Ain't you glad all the nurses and the doctors don't take off on Sunday? There are certain there are places where you have to do certain things on Sunday. And if you have to, you have to. If that's your job, if that's your, especially the, so the Lord's got that fixed. The Sabbath wasn't made for man, but the man for the Sabbath. That's the truth. Uh, or the other way around, I'm sorry. Uh, but the Sabbath for man. And the Lord's got that fixed up. So uh, I sure am. Listen, if ever cop in the United States says, well, Sunday, we can't work today. Well, you better lock yourself up and hide and get you a double barrel shotgun. And stay hunkered down. That's what it's going to get anyway, probably before it's over. But uh, uh, we, they, they, they do work, and I'm glad they do. I'm glad they do. But you take every other Sunday off, watch, watch church at home, watch church online, come on Sunday night, come on. If you do have a job where you have to work on Sunday, at least tell them you want off Sunday night to come to church. At least, so you can get one service a week, or you'll sue them, tell them something like that. Uh, uh, just kidding, but uh, uh, he, he abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. I'm telling you, we're going to have to stop. I was hoping to get through this chapter tonight, but there's just so much. Look at verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. See, Jesus don't have a body of believers, Jews, and then another body of Gentile. We're all in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you that were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. All right, I'm going to stop right there now. All right, turn, can, anybody got a question? Right quick, right quick over something I've said and we're going to pray and get a little work done here tonight before we go. Anybody got? Okay.